Hello, good evening and welcome to ITV News. This is Monday night's calendar. Yes, hello there. Thanks for joining us. Here are tonight's main stories. Vulnerable people using a drive through blood testing service in Yorkshire say they've been left at risk by a decision to close it. It's been a shocking demonstration of poor decision making and poor consultation. I have a cancer called myeloma, so every 28 days I need a blood test. So this is ideal for me. So why aren't we doing it more? Well, the answer is simply finance. South Yorkshire is about £100 million in debt. Ten years since being named the UK City of Culture, what's the lasting legacy of Hull's year in the limelight? I don't think we're any different, if I'm honest. I th if anything, I think it's worse. <laughs> There's nothing here anymore. No restaurants, no, no I, don't think, I don't think it benefited. Anglian Water warns that flooding like this will happen more often in Lincolnshire as our climate changes and... The golfer who's going places as he qualifies for the DP World Tour six years after we first featured him here on Calendar. Good evening, thanks for joining us. First tonight, thousands of clinically vulnerable patients who still fear the prospect of catching COVID-19 have described the closure of a drive-through blood testing service in Doncaster as frightening and bewildering. One cancer patient who uses the service, set up at the Eco Power Stadium to avoid close contact during the pandemic, says she's terrified at the thought of having to return to hospital for routine tests. Well, health bosses say the closure is part of a move back to pre-COVID ways of working, but thousands of people firmly believe they are making a mistake, as Emma Wilkinson reports. When this drive-through service first started, it was described as pioneering, and it's been popular with patients ever since. But NHS South Yorkshire says after three successful years, it is stopping the temporary service as it returns to pre-pandemic arrangements. Horrified, absolutely horrified. Christine has cancer and this service makes her feel safe because she says the risks posed by COVID are still very real for patients like her. Unfortunately, it, it took my husband, he died in May. Even though we were trying to be careful, it just shows you it, it, it is still there and it is a risk for people with, with low immunity. To expect you to go and sit where people are coming and going all the time, to be honest with you, it, it is really terrifying. What have we got? Throughout the morning there has been a stream of people arriving and within a couple of minutes having their bloods taken and leaving. NHS South Yorkshire says when this closes, people will continue to have the option of going to hospital or going closer to home to their GP practice. Well, I used to go to the hospital and use the park and ride, but since it's open, there's no comparison. And I think it's very short-sighted to remove something which works so well. It's been a shocking demonstration of poor decision-making and poor consultation. I have a cancer called myeloma. So every 28 days I need a blood test. So this is ideal for me. I don't have to get out of the car, it's in the fresh air, no risk. When the closure was announced, patients were told the change was part of a larger strategic and budgetary decision. But almost 5,000 people have now signed a petition for it to be saved, including boxing champion Terry Harper, who's used the service herself and is throwing her weight behind the campaign to save it. It's very efficient, um, it's quick, easy, um, it's accessible for many. Luckily I've got a social media platform where I can uh, get on there and help spread the word for, for those who generally need this service to stay open. In 2020, an independent review of diagnostics capacity in the NHS recommended the need for a new model, with more facilities in freestanding locations away from hospitals. And this local doctor agrees. So why aren't we doing it more? Well, the answer is simply finance. South Yorkshire is about £100 million in debt. So ideally, what we need is to reinvigorate another drive-through service, but do so on a shoestring budget. I do believe that's possible. So it would help to get everyone around the table to design that service. And the local MP is also lobbying NHS South Yorkshire 
to rethink. There's 1,500 patients a week coming through here and uh, every single one of them uh, thinks it's a wonderful service. They want it to stay open. I understand pressures on money. I do understand that. But it's, it's a minimal amount of money. It is definitely a backward step. Thank you so much. But it is a step that for now will be taken and the final patients will drive through here on Friday. Emma Wilkinson, ITV News, Doncaster. A man who stalked and stabbed to death a woman from Chesterfield took his own life shortly afterwards, an inquest has found. Michael Sellers was found dead in a field 150 metres away from where he'd just killed 23-year-old Gracie Spinks by stabbing her in the neck. In a statement at his inquest today, his father Stephen said he'd just shut down after being sacked from his job. He said Sellers had told his family, I don't want her to love me, I just want her to like me. Now, it's 10 years since Hull was awarded the title City of Culture and with it, the crown came promises of a legacy that it would never forget. It took up its mantle in 2017. But a decade on and what really is the impact of being in the spotlight for a year? Well, in a moment, we'll be talking to Rosie Millard, who took charge of Hull's big year. But first, Katie Oscroft takes us back to that day when it felt like Hull had won the lottery. The UK City of Culture 2017 is Hull. It was a city transformed. The accolade of culture capital lit Hull's blue touch paper and had people dancing in the aisles. City of Culture put the spotlight on Hull. There were around 3,000 events watched by 5 million people. But a decade after earning its crown, there are mixed views as to whether it's had a lasting effect. We've just been saying that there's no shops. There's nothing here anymore. No restaurants, no, no, I don't, think, I don't think it benefited. I don't think we're any different, if I'm honest. I think, if anything, I think it's worse. I think a lot of people from outside think, oh, I'll, I'll go to Hull for a bit of culture. Uh, I think they come for Hull there and I'll spot it, to be honest, but yeah. It's a lot quieter now, so I think you'd probably say not as effective as you thought it might have been. There's not as many people coming anymore. Um, and I think, yeah, we've sort of got forgotten about. Back then, the city's status brought royalty to town. Louise, who takes culture to the community, says Hull is still fit for a king. It's always been a special place and always will be a special place. And I think, you know, although the spotlight of the nation might not be on us every single day, but, you know, there's a buzz here and there always will be. Pat's a volunteer who tells visitors all about Hull's charms. She's carried on the work she started when the city's name first went up in lights. We've had them from down south, we've had them from Australia, New Zealand, I've had some South Africans. Um, today we've had people only just as far as Driftfield today, but um, we get people from all walks of life. And they definitely want to cover. And the council leader says the city walks taller. And what it's also done is just show the rest of the world what a fantastic place Hull is and also giving people here that sense that they have an opportunity to achieve here and not have to go elsewhere to fulfil their, their dreams and ambitions. And that's what five-month-old Rudy's mum and dad hope for their son. Could bring some more down here, especially down White Forget. <laughs> Could do something down there. So you want a bit more investment for your little one? Yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. definitely. This is a city divided on whether its cultural crown still glitters. Katie Oscroft, ITV News, Hull. Well, Rosie Millard was the chair of Hull City of Culture 2017. She joins us now from our studios in London. Rosie, uh, I was there at Hull Truck Theatre the morning that they made that announcement. I just remember that roar, the celebrations, they were phenomenal. But do you believe that 2017 lived up to all of that? Oh, yeah. In, in itself, I absolutely do. It was absolutely remarkable. And 95% of people in Hull went to at an event uh, during the year. There was a 95% engagement. Um, and Hull itself wasn't a particularly arty city uh, beforehand. It's a sporty city, if anything. But actually, people in Hull really took to the culture on offer, uh, which was very, very, um, it, was, it, was, it was quite outrageous and it was quite demanding. And it was, it was very, very different and totally wonderful and in particular for children and young people in Hull. They really got behind it and we, 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 we involved every school, we involved every child, 
Um, and uh, we had children dancing with the Royal Ballet outside Hull Minster. Uh, we had uh, we we had we had events right across the city, opera on the Humber Bridge. Um, it was absolutely terrific, and it gave the people in Hull a kind of confidence, which I do not think has gone. I mean, we talk about legacy. We have to remember the legacy of memory. I mean, do you remember the naked people lying down in that in that sea of Hull, all painted blue and green? People remember these sort of things. They remember that the city can hold such a outrageous and, and remarkable events. And that it was is fantastic, wasn't it? I'm sorry to interrupt you. We don't have a huge amount of time, but I'm just interested to know whether, I mean, you'll have heard the people in, in Katie's report there, whether people were missold the idea about what culture could long term do for a city like Hull. Well, I mean, what is long term? I mean, I think we have to we have to give things a really long time to embed. I think this has given the confidence. You know, Hull then went on to win thirty million pounds from the lottery in the Arts Council to turn it into Yorkshire's maritime city. We've had movies like David Copperfield of Victoria coming and filming in Hull. Screen Yorkshire now looks to Hull as a serious place for filming. Yeah, we have Lucy Beaumont's wonderful Hull Raisers on television. Hull is not laughed at anymore or pitied as, uh, as, an, uh, as a city where nothing goes on. Stuff does go on there. And, uh, 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 and again and again, there are new venues. There's a the Trinity Market. There's the, the new theatre. Les Mis, a, a proper big West End show, came up, played in Hull for one month. It had 90% capacity um, two years ago. And West End shows are now coming regularly regularly to Hull. That didn't happen before. Okay. And people Rosie, going I'm, out I, to see stuff. <laughs> I'm afraid I know you will champion Hull, uh, you know, till the cows come home, but we will have to leave you there. We're, uh, we're running out of time, but thank you very much indeed for talking to us. Do stay with us. Still to come, one of the best basketball shots you're ever likely to see. And after a cloudy, mild and damp weekend for most of us and clouding up today, will we actually get to see any sunshine this week? All the detail a little later on. One of our region's water providers says Lincolnshire is projected to face the most significant of challenges of any area it serves in the future. The report by Anglian Water looks at risks including those caused by climate change. Yes, it's pledging to invest £362 million in Lincolnshire in the next few years to try and build resilience against hotter periods of weather, a growing population and the threat of flooding. Well, Emma Hayward is live in Horncastle for us tonight. Emma, what does the report say? Well, Sally, we couldn't have been stood where we are a month ago because this area, this path, was underwater. Many parts of Horncastle were affected by the flooding and hundreds of homes across Lincolnshire were hit by the effects of Storm Babette. And we have seen, haven't we, in the past few years, the impact of a changing climate, those really, really hot summer days and then extreme temperatures during the rest of the year. And Anglian Water is saying there will be challenges in the decades to come. They're saying the flood risk here in Lincolnshire could be three times higher than the national average. I've been speaking to one farmer who was hit by the deluge a month ago. I could see water on the left, water on the right, and a reservoir in front of me. It is just forward planning and maintenance of the, of the, of the, of the drainage systems we've got. But it just needs that investment to do it. So we need to maintain the farmland as well because 50% of our farmland is on floodplains in this country and we need to maintain food security in this country. Emma, what's Anglian Water said they're going to do about all this? Well, Anglian Water says it's planning to invest billions of pounds in this huge area that it covers to try to mitigate some of those impacts of changing populations and also the impacts of climate change. Of course, one of those projects here in Lincolnshire is to build a new reservoir about 30 miles away from here near Sleaford. And that, they say, would serve about half a million homes. Water scarcity and combined with the needs of agriculture in our region are particularly unique challenges. And that's why we're putting forward plans for a new reservoir in the Fens to help support not only customer, customers' water supply, but also agriculture as well, because we recognise we all need to work together to make the most of the resources we've got available. Well, of course, these changes will hit the consumer. The company is predicting that the daily, daily water rate will go up by about 22p by the end of the decade. OK, Emma Hayward, live in Horncastle for us. Thank you.
Well, of course, it's exactly a month since those floods in Horncastle. And Kerry, has it actually been wetter than normal over the last few weeks? Yeah, well, just what um, Emma was saying there, a warmer and a wetter world. The whole world, if it just rises by one degree in uh, Celsius, we get 7% more water. And it might seem a little bit weird. I'll show you the map for November. It looks a little bit brown over many parts of Lincolnshire, but we'd expect 63% of this map on the left here. And we've already had 75% or more, and that's just November. But if you look at autumn and ranking the wettest, we're very blue to purple there, which is well above the average. And coupled with the temperatures, it's been really warm. This is our autumn, our mean 24 hour temperature in the uh, on the right there in the middle our mean minimum temperature, our overnight lows, we've not had anything particularly cold over the last three months. And to the left there, our mean maximum, which is ranked and we are currently at warmest. Now, it's not likely to stay that way. We might not be the warmest, but if you think the warmest in 140 year history, it's pretty staggering. So yes, we're still expecting that warmer and wetter world going forward. It was really warm on Saturday, wasn't yeah, it? It was really 15 miles. degrees in Sheffield. Yeah. That was our warmest place for the whole region. Um, everyone out in their winter coats, it looked horrible. It looked and settled but it definitely wasn't cold there is a bit of a shift so as we head through towards next weekend there is a bit of a shift it will be below average rather than above average and that's due to our air mass and we're getting a northerly so our air mass does change it will turn more colder or colder as we head friday into the weekend but actually at this stage nothing unusual it is of course almost the end of our season it is winter approaches it does kerry for now thanks very much of indeed course. Now, it's been revealed that almost half of school teachers across Yorkshire say they're ill-equipped to mark Disability Earth History Month, a situation which has been condemned by campaigners. From Albert Einstein to Beethoven and more recently Stephen Hawking, history is of course full of disabled people who change the world. But exclusive research from ITV News shows that 43% of teachers in Yorkshire and the North East don't feel they have the resources or the advice they need to teach it. Catherine Walker has more. Alice from Lincoln is one of 1.2 million disabled children across the UK. She's proud of her identity and is disappointed that more schools aren't celebrating Disability History Month. It would make such a massive difference. I, I would even go as far as saying it would be life-changing because there's so little education and awareness already. Um, and you'd think now there would be so much more and it would just make everyone's lives easier and why not want to understand how other people live and experience things? Disability History Month runs from the 16th of November to the 16th of December. But a survey by ITV News found that 43% of teachers in Yorkshire and the North East don't think they have the resources or advice they need to teach it. 31% said it wasn't a priority for their school leadership team. And 72% said they faced time pressure in a crammed curriculum. Only 13% of head teachers across the country confirmed their school was definitely celebrating. Well, I think after 14 years, that's a bit shocking, really, because I think if you ask them about Pride Month or uh, Black History Month, they'd all be saying they were doing something. Yet they've got more children in most of their schools who are disabled and they have a duty as public bodies to promote disability equality for disabled people. So we've been doing our unit on um, attitudes towards disability through time. In Chesterfield, it's an issue Kate Wilson has been working hard to address. Worried about the lack of options for her students, she designed her own disability history curriculum. A couple of years ago, we introduced a unit on disability over time. So we look at the theme of disability from medieval times right up to present day and how attitudes towards disability today have very much been shaped by historical views on that subject. It's made a huge difference to students like Kenzie, who's autistic. He wants to see lessons like this taught across the country. It's very important to me that people know like, what has happened and where things are going and what they need to do to help people. Because there's, like, there's not a much, as much awareness as like, other, like, other similar big issues like racism and homophobia. The government says freedom and flexibility in the national curriculum means there's no doubt that disabled people's history can be taught in schools. 
But ITV's own research shows that teachers want more resources so they can open the door to new lessons about disability. Catherine Walker, ITV News. Well, a little earlier, I spoke to Sharni Danda, who's a disability specialist. I started by asking her what she made of the ITV News findings. Well, I think the research is really important, but I am really disappointed by, by the low take-up and awareness, um, you know, from the respondents. But it also it doesn't surprise me. I myself attended a special needs primary school and I wasn't taught about Disability History Month or disability rights. So I, whilst I am shocked, I'm not that surprised. Which particular aspects of Disability History Month do you think it's important for children to learn about? I think it's really important to learn about all of it, you know, the, the people before us that really fought for the rights that we have today. But I also think it's important to understand the, the lived experience and the actual barriers and bias that disable people, because only if we understand them, both as disabled people and non-disabled people, will we be ever be able to change anything and to remove the disabling barriers that we face. And clearly it's important that children learn about these things from a young age. Why is it so important that primary school children are taught about Disability History Month? I think it's so important. You know, I talked about being segregated from non-disabled children in school and I know that's changing. But we live in a really diverse society. Disability touches every single community and culture that there is. And also we know that prevalence of disability is, is getting higher. And a lot of people, a lot of disabled people actually acquire their condition or their impairment. So this is something that we all need to learn about, let alone children. And what would you like to see happen next year when this month comes around? I would really love to see more people talk about it, educate one another about it, not only in schools, but in workplace, you know, more media on this topic and more representation across wider society. It's a really important issue that shouldn't be sidelined to just one month of the year. OK, Shani Danda, Disability Specialist, thank you very much indeed for joining us. Thank you. OK, now it's time to look back on the weekend sport. Zero Accounting Software. Sponsors ITV Regional Sports Report. Well, Chris is with us in the studio and the focus really this weekend has been on lower league teams. Yeah, that's right, Michael. The international break meant a, a well-earned rest for our Premier League and Championship teams. They need it, of course, don't they? There was, though, a first game in charge for the new Lincoln City boss, Michael Skabala. Sadly, it wasn't a winning start. The Imps beat a 1-0 at Stevenage. Elsewhere, managerless Grimsby came back from two goals down to draw up Forrest Green. Donovan Wilson with the equaliser, 10 minutes from time. And it's now five straight league wins for unbeaten Mansfield. Top scorer Davis Kelly are done with both goals in a 2-0 win over Newport. The Stags up to second. Elsewhere this weekend, on the day their five millionth fan passed through the doors at the Sheffield Arena, there was controversy in the Sheffield Steelers match against Glasgow. Trailing by two goals to one with just seconds of the game left, there was an almighty scramble in the Glasgow goal. The Steelers claimed the puck had crossed the goal line. Sadly for them though, the officials thought otherwise. Now take a look at this, one of the most outrageous basketball shots you're ever likely to see. That's the Sheffield Sharks' Jalen Pipkins with the three-pointer from deep inside his own forecourt as the Sharks beat Leicester by 91 points to 84. Don't know about you guys, but three points, it should be at least ten that, shouldn't oh, it? Oh, I could do that. Do you reckon? <laughs> Certainly on, not. Then. Let's yeah. get a basketball net up. Certainly Where's the hoop? No, Let's I don't think so. Well, pulling off something so. like that takes hundreds, thousands of hours of practice, doesn't it? Sport's all about putting in the hard hours. And that's exactly what 18-year-old Josh Berry from Doncaster has done. And now, well, it's paid off. Josh has qualified for the DP World Tour, what was the European Tour. And this week will line up with some of the best players in the world at the Joburg Open. And before he flew out to South Africa, I caught up with Josh at his home club. Josh Berry recently learned to drive a car, but this kid's been driving here at Doncaster Golf Club since he was nine years old. Now Josh is getting ready to hit the road after qualifying for the DP World Tour. 
absolutely amazing. I mean, I've been dreaming about it for so long and now that it's finally happened and I can just go out there and just with no pressure really and just play golf like I have been and just, I just can't wait. He's a real role model for all junior golfers, not just in Doncaster but for everywhere. He's, um, he's dedicated himself to playing golf, practicing every day and now he's on the DP World Tour. So proud of him. Josh had to come through five weeks of intense competition at qualifying school. The last three were in Spain where he needed to finish inside the top 25. This putt ensured his qualification. Yes! The first stage it was friendly and speak to people you know and by the final round on the third stage it's like <laughs> no one speaks to each other. Every man for himself. Yeah. <laughs> My heart rate was certainly racing throughout the round for him. Uh, always keeping an eye on the leaderboard, you know, you, you know, looking at his caddy every now and again. And, you know, we were kind of sharing the emotions and it was just a real surreal moment. Josh will have to get used to the cameras following his every move, but this isn't the first time he's appeared on calendar. So we filmed with you when you were, what, 12 years old? Yeah. Six years ago? Uh, I don't know if you remember it, but... Um, Hopefully uh, this will uh, refresh your memory because I've got it here. So I'll take a look at it's it. It's the pin high prodigy with a 250 yard drive. <laughs> For Josh Berry, golf is more than just a hobby. The 12 year old spends hours a day look at the fringe. at Doncaster <laughs> Golf Club, often forfeiting dinner time for extra tea time. I play most days and when I'm at the driving range, I'm usually there for about two or three hours. Can you believe how far you've come in those six years? I know it's been a hell of a journey. I've it's been blood, sweat and tears really, just every day waking up before the sun rises and just practicing every day. It's just, can't believe it's happened really. Well, his voice might be deeper, he's got a few extra hairs on his chin, but not that much has changed for Josh. He was a good prospect then, he's a great prospect now. The difference is he's now getting paid to play the game he loves. Yeah, it's always great, isn't it? You go and do those jobs when they're 12 years old, these sporting prodigies, and then they go and make it it's in the big hope. time. That's what you hope for, isn't it? You hope, don't you? You never expect. I but... think perhaps you were his uh, lucky charm, Chris. Maybe. Do you think? Yeah, I Maybe. think it was the opposite all those years I'll ago. I'll take all the credit. I'll take a cut, actually, from Josh, if you're listening. Josh, <laughs> hey, I'll take a cut from that. Yeah, you could yeah. do oh, We know how to spot him here on calendar. We certainly do. More uh, luck than judgment, Michael, but we do. <laughs> we'll take yeah. that. Chris, thanks very Thank much you. indeed. Well, now let's see what the weather has in store for us. Here's Kerry with the full forecast. Good visibility on the horizon. TUI sponsors ITV Yorkshire weather. Hello again. It did cloud up from the north during the second half of today, but there was indeed a little bit of sunshine around first thing this morning. And Lincolnshire once more getting the lion's share of the sunshine. A big thank you for sharing your photos. Weather photos at ITV.com. So yes, it was a mix of cloudy skies and clear spells during the course of today. Those clearer skies to the south first thing, but nudging in from the north quite a bit of cloud. And it leaves a messy old story as we head through into this evening and overnight tonight. The risk of showers, quite cloudy misty and murky a damp feel to things and with a north northeasterly by the end of the night dragging quite a bit of moisture off the north sea and potentially a few showers by dawn with all that going on though we're definitely frost free 738 and 355 are your sun times for tomorrow don't be too disappointed with the morning cloudy misty murky quite showery and breezy certainly out towards the coast it's an improvement we hope into the afternoon to drier and brighter conditions still the risk of a shower and I say bright rather than sunny perhaps there might be quite a bit of thin very high cloud which might turn the sunshine the limited sunshine into the afternoon rather hazy then nothing too dramatic as we head through into Wednesday the cold front stays to the north until Thursday perhaps some showery outbreaks initially for the morning quite breezy conditions certainly for the coast and right over the tops of the Pennines but we stay mild and unsettled Wednesday into Thursday by day and by night so Thursday is quite blustery sunshine and showers that cold front will nudge its way down from the north eventually and it's the clearance behind that that gives the different weather feel Friday into the weekend so the winds will become lighter the temperatures will take a dip and there will be a mix at this stage of sunshine and showers. TUI sponsors ITV Yorkshire Weather. There you go, that's your forecast. Well, it might not feel very wintry, but it certainly looks like Christmas around my way. There's lots of trees up already, you know. Really, already? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Some would say maybe a bit early. Well, some might say. I yeah. couldn't comment. <laughs> <laughs> right, that's about it from uh, us for now. I'll be back with the late news at 5 past 11. Mary's next. 
We'll see you later. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.